Hey, good evening. My name is uh, Rene LaBelle. I'm your host tonight. Um, I'm delighted that you all showed up this evening. I see some new faces, so I'm, I'm curious to know who's here for the very first time. Wonderful, that's great. It's been, okay, you, you're a re repeat customer. Okay, well thanks very much for coming back. And I'm sure you've memorized the uh, quiz that I've got over, I mean memorized the uh, slides over here, because you have a quiz at the end on that, so. But anyways, I'm, I'm delighted that you came here. I wanted to wish you all a happy 2019. Um, we do this uh, now five times a year, it used to be six. It's the third Tuesday of the odd month. But since the, the symposium, the project management symposium, happens in May, this event no longer happens in May. So that's, that's the only way I can remember to be here is on the third Tuesday of the odd month. That's why I call it the third Tuesday of the odd month. And that's what Neil's uh, slides say, third Tuesday of the odd month. Anyways, Neil is uh, on faculty here. It's a new appointment, so he teaches a course here. Uh, I've known Neil for several years. I met him through the UT Dallas Project Management Symposium, and we've become good friends. And uh, I don't like conflict, but that's tonight's con uh, concentrated topic. So I'm looking forward to uh, his presentation on conflict. And as an introduction, um, you will quickly realize that he's from Scotland. He has a great Scottish accent. And there's one little story that I, I will try and tell as quickly as possible. Uh, Neil is a scuba diver. And uh, we won't say how long ago, but many years ago, he was in a little tiny part of Scotland. And uh, he was scuba diving with his buddies. And it was a late night dive around 2 AM. and. They had a big surprise when they got back on shore because uh, someone who had had too much to drink at the bar was watching from a distance as these people with neoprene suits and flashing lights, and it kind of looked like a drug transaction was going on offshore. And so the, uh, basically the equivalent of the DAA had a roadblock when they were coming back into town, and so they got busted. But there weren't any drugs in the van, so... So they had a two-hour detention as everything was taken out of their van. And as, as the punchline is that, fortunately, they put it all back in the van for them. So, And I'm sure Neil can add a little bit more detail to that. He sent me a long description on it. But it, I'm looking forward to a wonderful presentation. Please help me welcome Neil. Thank you, Rene. Thank you. I'd like to start with a dis the usual disclaimer. Yeah. Today I'm going to be expressing my own opinions and not the opinions of the PMI or the Dallas chapter. I also need to tell you that I'm, I'm not a psychoanalyst um, and I'm not a medical doctor, but I'd love to play one on television if any of you is a, is a talent scout, you know? No? I keep trying. I keep hoping for that extra... <laughs> yes. Actually, it's, it's, it's quite funny that Rene should tell that story. There's a big difference between Scots humour and English humour. So when the English talk about um, toilet humour, they usually mean doubler entendres, double entendres, if you like. Yeah, a bit like Monty Python, if anyone's old enough to remember them. them. Scottish people tend to talk about toilet humour meaning smelly things. So what was particularly funny for us was that all 12 of us had been wearing dry suits because the water's so cold. So essentially, we'd been wearing this, this underwear, which was very, very smelly because this was the seventh day of diving, this night dive. So these poor police officers had to go through all our dive bags and go through our stinky underwear. So I really, really felt for them at the time. And that's got absolutely nothing to do on the topic of conflict in the workplace. I want to, um, I want to ask, a show of hands please, how many of you work in project management? Okay, virtually everybody here. And has anybody ever suffered from stress? Yeah? I was a carrier. You were a carrier. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I promise I'm not going to get anyone to talk about their stress unless they particularly would like to. But it, just by a show of hands, has anyone lost sleep over stress? Yeah? I, I have as well. And has anyone felt that the stress was brought on by a particular person or a particular group of people? You know, over, over the years, different projects. Has anyone felt that someone was being very unreasonable or a small group of people? Yeah? So what I'm hoping to do is take you from being like this poor fellow here to sleep like a baby. 
And that's my, that's my objective today. So, we're probably all familiar with the conventional way of looking at conflict in the workplace. So I've just cherry-picked this. I've actually random-picked this off the, the internet. The workplace, in the workplace, conflict can be very healthy. Has anyone read that kind of story before? It, it, it gets you to, it gets people to delve deeper and look at the problems. Um, it, you, tend to, you, you tend to brainstorm and come up with new ideas, better ways of doing things. You know, that, that's the sort of uh, traditional way of looking at conflict, is it not? So, let's talk about conventional wisdom for a moment. And let's look at my very word-heavy slide here. We like democracy. We like to be kind to people. We like to make everybody feel included. So my first bullet point there says that everyone on the team, yeah, whether they're in the project management team or the shareholders or the stakeholders or the owner of the project, everybody should be able to express their opinions without fear of getting laughed at or some form of retribution. W would we all agree with this? Yeah, I'm seeing a few nodding heads. Okay, we like to get away from finger pointing. We don't want to say that it's your fault. We like to say, oh, there's something wrong with the process. Let's fix the process so this problem doesn't reoccur. Am I, am I correct? That's the conventional wisdom, yeah? And also, we need to accept that workplace conflict is inevitable because we see all the time people are always going to disagree. We accept that. And then we go ahead and we see very obvious things like avoiding them won't make them go away. But if you remove yourself from the situation for a little while, it gives you an opportunity to analyze what's going on. Does this all sound familiar? It fosters creativity because the conflict can turn into a discussion, other people can join in, and people come up with good ideas and try to solve it together. Yeah? And also, it can point out a problem. For example, my third bullet point there, which is unclear guidelines. Somebody somewhere, probably you, the project manager, because let's face it, the project manager is always the one that's to blame. Yeah, you probably got it wrong, and you didn't, ha you didn't have clear guidelines, so let's fix that. And again, my fourth bullet point here is someone who's creating the conflict or getting upset in some way may simply feel underappreciated. And therefore, we as a project manager, we use our people's skills to make that person feel better, to feel included, if you like. This is one of my favorite authors going back to the beginning of this century. So this is going back quite a while in terms of the way that psychologists yeah, and behavioral analysts think about conflict. This is way back, way, way back, 17, 18 years ago. Now, believe it or not, I've got lots and lots of sources. I've just cherry-picked out a few just to give you a flavor of what I've found over the months and years that I've been looking at conflict. 42% of a manager's time is spent addressing conflict in the workplace in some shape or form. We won't go into definitions, but it, I think we can all agree it sucks up a fair minority of your time dealing with problems on an ad hoc basis, in a real-time basis, if you like. Most performance problems are caused by employee conflict. Not necessarily with you, the project manager, but between team members or stakeholders. When I say stakeholders, it could be two different stakeholders who are expecting different outcomes from the project, whatever that may be. Or, just for example, who may feel that their functional resources that have been, are temporarily being used yeah, to support the project are being unfairly allocated. In other words, this one isn't putting enough resources in. Yeah? And this one feels he's being taken advantage of, and so on. I don't need to labor this, because I think you all know what I'm talking about here. And this is an interesting one. And this figure, or a figure very similar to it, turns up a lot. A third of a trillion dollars lost, and this is just the US, this is not worldwide, in time and productivity because of workplace conflict. 
And here are some other statistics. So a fair number of people in due course sometime during their career will decide to leave a job that otherwise is a good job, that otherwise they may be well suited to because of conflict. They just don't want to handle this anymore. Let's go somewhere else where I won't need to suffer, need to watch this become stressed over workplace conflict. Let's find a job where I will be happier. Here's another one as well. 61% of employees have stated that workplace stress made them sick. And here's this almost uh, third, of a bill, uh, third of a trillion dollar figure turning up in this study as well. Now, this is something I'm sure you've seen before. The idea that people don't leave a company, they leave their manager. Is anyone familiar with this concept? Yeah? Yeah, it, it turns up quite a lot. It turns up quite a lot. People don't leave their company, they leave the manager that they are working for, possibly because they feel the manager's being unreasonable, possibly because they have conflict with said manager. This particular one comes from, from Gallup, but there are many, many uh, examples of studies that have looked at this. Now, I want to take, I want to talk for a moment about the alternative view. And by the way, I forgot to say at the beginning, please call out your questions at any time. I'll have time for questions at the end, but please just call out your questions. Just raise your hand so I can see who's asking the question of me. So please feel free to, to jump in with any questions or even anecdotal stories that agree with what I'm saying or disagree with what I'm saying. Okay. So this is a different source that felt that people, or found statistically, that people don't leave their jobs because they've got a bad boss. This particular one found that people leave their jobs because of lack of opportunity. Now this is curious because conventional wisdom has always been, I don't like my boss, therefore I am moving on. So it kind of muddies the water. What's really going on here? What's making people unhappy? Sir? They go together, right? I'm so sorry, I didn't hear. They go together. So they go together? Good, Please yeah, say why. A good boss would give you better development. That is a very good point. The, the gentleman's commented that a good boss would give you opportunities to expand and elevate and grow your skill set. Very good point. They go together. They're complementary. Okay? But just to state that this particular study found that um, commitment went up yeah, when there were more development opportunities. Okay? And we can all draw our own conclusions as to why this is happening, the underlying reason for it. Okay? Now, things have been tough over the last 10 years. Now, I know that the headline unemployment rate is, it, is at the lowest it's been for a while. But at the same time, there are a few studies and many anecdotal stories that have found that most people are not very happy in their jobs at all. Yeah? Worldwide, I think it's 85% of all employees do not like their job. Not necessarily hating their job, although some do, but do not like their job. Various studies in the US are saying 60 to 65% of people stay in jobs that they really don't like. So here's a rhetorical question. Why do you think they do that? Actually, let's not make it rhetorical. Would anybody like to comment? Why do people stay in a job that they don't like? Sir? Not necessarily easy to move. Not easy to move because... Okay. You may have a personal situation that precludes you from, from leaving a circumstance. So, uh, you may have a very narrow job, you're a specialist, mm -hmm. and it, there, there might be opportunities, but you might have to leave the area. 
pay. So you may be a specialist, you don't feel that your job is portable, or if it's portable, you may have to uproot yourself and move to a different city in a different state, taking your family with you. Sir? Yeah, I, was just, I was just gonna say, it's, it's the devil you know. <laughs> so it's the, either the job that you have, or uncertainty about uh, how quickly uh, you could land the next job, or whether you'd like the job when you landed it uh, subsequently. Okay, so it, it's fear of potentially ending up in a job that turns out also not to be particularly good, out of the frying pan into the fire, yeah? So fear, so fear in general. And also notice here, I, I, I've cherry-picked out this particular study. If you're over 50, the chances are the decision to leave your job won't be yours. Now, I'd like to spend a moment just thinking about this, yeah? In this particular study, it looked at people who had been in, who were now 50 or 51 years old in the United States who had been in a job for at least five years, what most of us would call a stable job. And the study followed these people over the next 15, 16, 17 years until the retirement age for them depending upon their age at the time because of course it's, it's changing over time. And what was discovered was that of these people over the age of 50 who were in what is regarded as a steady job, 56% of them had to leave that job through no choice of their own. Yeah? It's kind of scary. So of, that, of the entire group, I think it was 20,000 people, only 19% retired voluntarily, and 16% were still working. And in a separate study, it was found, again in the United States, that 7% of people in this kind of situation ended up, ended up being, below, uh, being below the poverty line in retirement even though they'd been putting away a good percentage of their income and they'd been earning a good income over these years. So, what I'm saying to you is this, that anyone that's over a particular age, and by the way, federally, yeah, you can be discriminated, age discriminated against by the time you're 40, it just so happens this study says 50, people in their 40s, 50s and upwards are genuinely scared of moving because they might not get another job at all. So what I'm saying is, people are fearful in their job, and the evidence is that they'd rather stay in the job and be overstressed than push back against the conflict that's causing them that stress. Okay, let's see what the pin box says about stress. In fact, I'll let you read these uh, three bullets. So the pin box goes on to say that you should withdraw or avoid conflict, smooth over the conflict, compromise or reconcile, force the conflict, that's direction, or collaborate and problem solve. Sadly, the pinbot doesn't go on to tell us how to make these five things happen. But the PMI website has got a wonderful article that I like by Jeffrey K. Pinto and O.P. Carbanda. And I've summarized roughly what they recommend. So in each of the slides that I'm going to show you now, the first bullet is the definition, if you like, or the advice that's given by the PMBOK. And the second one is what these two authors recommend. So let's just go through them. So retreating from potential conflict and postponing the issue gives you an opportunity to resolve the issue or have someone else help you resolve it. 
So this is the avoid conflict management. So what they are saying, these two authors are saying, is you have the opportunity to come up with better ideas. Also means you have a chance to think through the other person's point of view. But they also say is that just delaying by procrastinating, it's possible that you could exacerbate the conflict, therefore resulting in negative effects on the project. Here's the smoothing one. Yeah, we're going to emphasize areas of agreement rather than areas of difference. Yeah, and doing a little bit of concession, if you like. Yeah, trying to maintain harmony in relationships. And what the two authors say is that um, it recognizes the importance of the professional relationships. And we want to make sure that we're able to maintain these relationships long term. And if we can get over everything, if we can smooth it out, if we can fix it, yeah, we'll then strengthen the team. Yeah? Here's the compromise or reconciliation. So they are saying that we recognize that some conflicts cannot be fully solved. So we're looking for a halfway house, some degree of satisfaction that all of the parties to the conflict can agree on. And then we're going to problem solve or brainstorm. So incorporating multiple viewpoints and insights from different perspectives requires a cooperative attitude, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the two authors believe that this is the most productive technique, and it has two major benefits. That the conflict, they say, under these circumstances, would be solved, and that, again, the project team would come together, and they'd all be best friends. So the technique is most likely to be successful where the project team already has a high level of trust. So there's an assumption here, the high level of trust. Here we are, the one where the more draconian boss yeah, simply says, this is what's going to happen. I'm in charge. Do it. And we all know from experience that sometimes it works. You know, if there is an emergency and the team already has that level of trust, yes, we'll all get on with it. But if this is the way of managing on a regular day-to-day -to -day -to -day basis, well, I think we can agree it's, it's not going to work. Okay, and it's easy to justify when we have a simple example here like thou shalt wear your hard hat and your safety glasses. It's not something that people can argue with if you like. So that's kind of an over uh, simplified situation. These are two separate studies. And so these are reports back. They don't necessarily add up to 100%, but I'll let you read that for a moment. So I'm going to do something naughty, and I'm going to go backward in the slides for a moment. All of these five strategies have something in common. If they work, and as we as project managers, or as general managers, or functional managers that some of you may be as well, if they work, why do we have this? Why do we have the stress? There's an assumption in here. There's an assumption to conventional wisdom. Something slightly wrong. There's an assumption here that everybody on the team wants us to succeed. Let me explain that. I'm an ethical, normal person, I believe. I treat people kindly. I'm looking into all of your faces, and I think you're normal, ethical people. Yeah? We have, we have expectations of the way that people will behave towards us. If we smile at someone, they'll smile back. If I put my hand out, you'll probably shake it. Yeah? If I'm kind to you, you will reciprocate. That's normal society. 
reciprocity is the norm for human beings the whole world over. But what happens if there's someone on your team or a functional manager or a stakeholder that doesn't want you to succeed? Consider that. What happens if there's a saboteur that genuinely, genuinely does not want the project to succeed because they've got their own agenda? How can one handle that? Because I don't know about you, but I'm not wired to think along that way. I assume I give everybody the benefit of the, of the doubt. I assume that everybody on the team wants the, the project to succeed, the business to, business to succeed, the company to grow, the profitability to go up, for everybody's jobs to be more secure. Don't you expect that as well? So what happens if there's somebody in there, one of the people you mentioned earlier on, some of you, you know, that person from your past who was a complete pain, who seemed to be trying to sabotage your project, what happens if they actually were? What if you were right? What happened if your gut was correct? So I want to talk about that for just a little while, if I may. Before that, though, I want to talk just for a moment about the health issues that can affect people on your team and you personally, if the conflict is allowed to continue, because I think it's more serious than many of us manage. <coughs> Here are the top 10 health issues that will come out from workplace-related stress. And when I delved down deeply, I discovered that some of these conditions are very serious indeed. I mean, you'll recognize many of them yourself, the heart disease, the diabetes, depression and anxiety that we covered on an earlier slide. Yeah, a couple of ones at the bottom, they look at these, eight, nine, and 10. These I didn't expect. So the reason I want to talk about this next topic is to protect you, is to protect me from this adversary, yeah, that's sabotaging your pro, not just your project, but sabotaging your life, sabotaging your health. Now, back in 2014, I was giving, giving, I was giving a presentation to the, the, the PM Symposium here. Yeah, it was August of that year, 2014. And I was talking, I was talking about getting back ex experts. Um, expert recognition for project managers, if you like. Referent power, yeah? Expert power. Expert power is when people respect you because you know what you're talking about. Referent power, if you remember from, from the PIMBOK, is when you impress people with your own personality, if you like, not necessarily your expertise, but the way you behave toward them gets them to listen to you. And just as a little aside, in the middle of that, I happened to mention some then new study about psychopaths in the workplace. This is August of 2014. And most of the audience took it in in their stride. A couple scratched their head. And two people in the audience actually took umbrage. They actually got a little bit upset with me. Um, and at the time, I had my paper, and I was able to quote to them, these are the studies, this is not my opinion, you know, there are learned people and PhDs and studies are showing that 1% of society in America are psychopathic, and that in the business arena, people in senior positions, it goes up to 3%, and in one study to 4%. And they're all thinking, that's just ridiculous. But the thing is, people are biased by this poor fella. Because you think about Psycho, and you think about the Hitchcock movie from 1960. This is poor Anthony Perkins. Does everybody recognize Anthony Perkins? It was a Hitchcock movie called, called Psycho. Yeah, he was the guy with the, the, the knife that dressed up as his mother and stabbed the poor lady. He was actually, during the late 1950s, he was actually a pop singer. Yeah. 
He was a heartthrob. He, he was um, li liked by the young ladies. They go out and buy their his, his singles. He was he was believed to be you know extremely happy, uh, extremely good looking and happy. Um, and I saw him interviewed in television a number of years later. Believe it or not, he was so successful in this role that he was typecast, and his career was decimated. He did have other acting parts on the television in, in Europe, but because he was so recognizable as the psycho, his career was um, effectively destroyed. And there's a problem for us, because we think a psycho is someone that kills people. It turns out that they don't. Before I move on to my next slide, there was actually an article I read just this morning. It's on Forbes. I'm going to read it to you. So it's how to recognize a workplace psychopath. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to giggle until I read this. A 2010 study published in the Journal of Research and Personality examined what separates psychopaths who end up in prison and psychopaths who succeed in business. Researchers discovered successful psychopaths exhibit the same core features and traits as other psychopaths. Here's the list. Dishonesty, exploitation, arrogance, low remorse, minimizing self-blame, callousness, and shallow effect. One more paragraph. They are charming, carefree, and aggressive. They are skilled at dealing with people and constantly look out only for themselves. Now, I'm not saying that all people in business are psychopaths. But many of the people that you've come across in the past who have behaved in a way that you could not explain or understand or control could have been a psychopath. But statistically, they were probably just a wannabe. Yeah? Probably just somebody who had a hidden agenda, who was more interested in going up the ladder, in looking good, in getting that pay raise. You with me? So I'm not saying that every person who works against you is a psychopath. I'm just saying that there are people, demonstrably, people out there who have their own agenda and they don't care if they mess up your project. They don't care if they mess up the business. Yeah? And you need to be on your guard to protect the business you're working for, perhaps your own business, and your own health. So, let's delve just a little bit deeper. I first get interested in the topic, that particular topic, when I read the book on the left. So, Robert Hare, he's now about 87, I think. So he is a psychologist. He's worked for all kinds of agencies. He's helped the FBI for decades. What's, what's that TV show, Criminal Minds? They've got a team of people that they try and figure out the characteristics of the person that they committed the murder. Is that, is that, am I getting it right? Criminal Minds? Yeah. Well, he was doing that kind of thing for the FBI for years. He probably still does it, even though he's in his late 80s. So he started out... The first book from 1999 is looking at psychopaths in the prison system. But this one from 2007 with the other PhD yeah, is probably the first time that somebody started talking seriously about psychopaths being successful in the business place in America. So he's the guy that I like to follow. Now, since... Since the people in 2014 here at UTD, or at least a couple of people in the audience, the rest of the audience were very receptive. Yeah. Since then, we've seen articles appear in the mainstream, the BBC, Forbes, I just read to you a moment or two ago. It's now got its own Wikipedia page, so it must be true. Yeah. So people are recognizing that we have a problem in the workplace. And believe it or not, the author of the book that I just mentioned, yeah, has a, a checklist that's now used by the profession to try and identify if some, someone has psychopathy or not. Yeah, most of us score five or less. Yeah. There are 20 indicators, by the way. I've just cherry-picked out seven. Yeah, 
and the, the score goes up to 40. And if somebody has 30 or more, then according to the professionals, that person has psychopathic tendencies. Here's a quote from a TEDx on YouTube. I'll let you read it yourselves. So they're charming. We don't even realize we're, we're being manipulated. Someone's saying nice things to us, they're shaking our hand, they're smiling at us, you know, they're kind to us, or at least they appear to be. We've got no idea that they've got this hidden agenda. You know, I, I'm defenseless. I'm defenseless because I give people the doubt, you know? And what's worked in the past to mend fences for me or to build people up, yeah? time and time and time again, somehow doesn't work with this person and it does not com uh, compute. And I get stressed out and my project begins to slip behind or fail. Conflict starts to arise and I can't understand why. It's because I'm being manipulated by an expert. So I, this is not directly specific to conflict, but I just love this quote <laughs> from Mark Twain. And don't you just sometimes feel, wish I could do that, you know, wish I could do that. Take them outside. Yes. Okay. You may recognize this fella. This is Machiavelli. Has anyone read Machiavelli, the prince? The prince? Yeah, oh, I see a few hands. That's good. It was, um, he published it in 1532, his book. It's a very light read. I think it's 26 chapters, but they're really short. It's like two hours to read it from the beginning to the end. Um, it came out at an interesting point in history. He lived in Florence in Tuscany, what's now northern Italy. And uh, many, many people, experts, would, would say that the Renaissance began, you know, about 100 years earlier, but in Florence. Um, 1532 was a, an interesting time. I think that um, Martin Luther, so only 15 years ago, 15 years before, over in Saxony, he would have uh, printed his 95 theses. Yeah. John Calvin would be about 22, 23. So they, they're the two folks that are attributed with starting the, the Reformation. Yeah, so there's a lot going on at that time in, in Europe. And so this group of people you know, were looking at the Bible, for example, and deciding, you know, looking at ethics for a second time, reinterpreting the Bible. And then the, the other extreme, you had Machiavelli writing The Prince that some people called the anti-Bible at the time. And you may have heard the expression, Old Nick. That was attributed to him, Niccolo Machiavelli. He was the devil. He was Old Nick because he'd written this anti-Bible. So what happens in The Prince? Well, is, does anyone do video games? Has anyone played Ages of Empire, Empire Earth, Civilization? Is that? No? Is anyone, is anyone old enough to remember uh, Star Trek, the original series? Yeah? I see a few hands. Okay. In the, in the, in the first series, the, the, good, the good season, there was an episode in the middle called The Conscience of the King. The Conscience of the King. And there was this Shakespearean troop moving from planet to planet. And the head of the troop somebody believed was uh, Kodos the Executioner, yeah, uh, suspected of, of killing people. So there'd been, there'd been a colony with 8,000 people and the food was largely de destroyed. So Kodos or Kolos had killed 4,000 of the colonists, so the other 4,000 had enough to eat. Makes perfect sense. That's the prince. That's the prince. It's about, it's about using the resources you have in a very smart, you know, very smart way. E economic sense, if you like. This is a quote. And this is what I would like you to be. A sleeping tiger. Everybody sees you. Nice, cuddly, sleeping. But if you're prepared, you can jump up. Not necessarily kill somebody, <laughs> but certainly defend yourself 
against this saboteur, your adversary. Let's call him adversary from now on. Bless you. So, this is my advice. And this is what I've been doing when there's even a hint, even a hint of an adversary, whether it's a psychopath or just a wannabe or someone who clearly is trying to sabotage my project. This is number one. What am I saying here? Putting your hands together and singing Kumbaya isn't going to work. Trying to be democratic, trying to be reasonable isn't going to work with this person. So you need to take power. You need to assume power. You need to call your adversary, adversary's bluff. They may complain about you. They may go to senior manager. But is it really likely, if you're the project manager, is it likely that the owner is going to take you off the project? I don't think so. They may ask you. They may ask you to be a little bit kinder to the person, and you can go through the motions and say, oh, yes, yes, I'll treat him more kindly from now on. What I'm saying is don't. Assume that this per with this person, until the doubt is removed, assume, assume that this person is your adversary. So don't try to be reasonable with the person. Dominate from the get-go. So from the moment you suspect, even suspect, that uh, this person is an adversary, yeah. refuse all of his requests. Practice in the mirror saying no. Practice it in your head. You will be forgiven. Because let's face it, if I was to be rude to you, if I, if I, Neil, was to be rude to you, and I came to you later today and said, look, I'm real sorry. You know, I was out of order there. Would you forgive me? I think you would forgive me. I forgive people. Normal people forgive each other. So if you make a mistake and you dominate from the get-go, and you're offensive to people, and then you later on discover you were mistaken, you'll be forgiven. Yeah? But first, you have to protect yourself from the adversary, the person that's trying to sabotage your project. Clarify your authority. At a time of your choosing, with the team members present, but not one-to-one -one with the person, Try never to be one-to-one -one with the person because that is when they will most try to manipulate you when there isn't an audience. Make it clear to the whole team that you are the boss, what your expectations are. Don't use emotional blackmail. Oh, listen, guys, you know, we really need to get this done by such and such a date. Uh, otherwise, you know, I I'm going to get into trouble, you know, or I'm going to get rapid. Don't try any of that because it won't work because all you're doing is showing your adversary your weak point, something that the, your adversary is going to exploit, okay? Impose your structure on all the meetings. This is not a democracy. You're in control, therefore be in control. Don't let him, don't let him take you off on a wild goose chase. Watch out for red herrings. Don't be diverted. Maintain control, be draconian, be authoritarian, think Machiavelli. But at the same time, I know what you're good at. You're all good at soft power. You're all good at diplomacy. You're good at speaking with people. This is when you're going one-to-one -one with everybody else, not your adversary, okay? So in private, you know, do, influ do influence people. You know, appeal to their best interests in private, out of sight. That's when you can be demonstrative. That's when you can be huggy with the right people, shake the hand, pat them on the back, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah? That's when you're using your soft skills to make people feel happy, make people feel valued. Yeah? Congratulating them, thanking them, encouraging them, and such like. But always out of sight of your adversary. Question.
really understood why they weren't supportive that I was able to figure out a way around it. Okay. The, the question is, when we recognize an adversary, what can we do to understand why they behave the way they do? Right, my answer to that is don't try to understand. I'm incapable of understanding a psychopath, and I would suggest that most of the people in this room are also incapable because we can't empathize. They're so very, very different. We can't empathize with someone who's got no empathy, essentially. They have no empathy, so we can't empathize with them. We cannot put ourselves in their shoes. So what I'm saying is use this toolbox that I'm offering to you to deal with them. Keep them on the back foot. Never give them a break. Never let them, you know, force their way in the door. Never let them under your skin. Defend yourself. And if, it, while doing it, you're offending everybody else, the normal people, use your soft power in private, one-to-one. -one. Yeah? And if necessary, apologize or explain to them, to a certain degree, what's happening. I mean, they will forgive you just as you will forgive them because the rest of us are normal people. Yeah? Thank you for your question. Delegate enforcement, okay? Don't use your power when you've got a willing lieutenant, lieutenant, when you've got a willing lieutenant to be your enforcer. So, if you're hosting a meeting and you're unhappy with elements of your adversary's report, and this assumes that your adversary hasn't come up with a way of fixing things, remedial action that's satisfactory to you, yeah? Don't give your own advice. Even though there's a team there, don't give your advice to that person. You're in control, you can tell them what to do, but don't give advice. Get one of your lieutenants to tell your adversary how to solve their problem. And you can nod your head regally, like the king, yeah? And get the whole team to nod their head as well. And it looks like the team has told him or her, your adversary, what to do. And at the end of it, you say, right, this is what's going to happen. Make sure it's minuted. And your adversary is going to recognize, uh, I've written there, fait accompli. Yeah? You, the project manager, have won at least this, this battle, if you like. So get your lieutenant or several lieutenants to tell your adversary what to do. And at the end of it, you say, right, that's what's going to happen. Don't... Don't give your adversary an opportunity to argue with you. You with me? Make sure you maintain power and control all the time. Monitor your advers adversary's work at all levels. Now, I know you're like me. You like to empower people. You know, you, you give people direction and you say, right, off you go. You trust people to do the job. You don't have to be micromanaging them. Yeah? unless it's your adversary, okay? You're going to break your own rule. Don't just ask your adversary for the usual progress reports that you ask for <coughs> from everybody else on your team. Ask him to show you his record keeping because he or she will lie. They'll give you a report that makes it appear that they're fulfilling all their milestones, all of their tasks, yeah? But I bet you when you start delving deeper, and asking for more information and proof, yeah, his or her case will fall apart, yeah? And it's another way of pushing and pushing and pushing, if you like, to make sure that you maintain control, not your adversary. And I've said at the bottom there, one of the easiest ways for him or her to sabotage your project would be to overstate the project, and if they were to do that, you didn't find out about it, of course, when you do find out about it, it may be too late. And let's remember, who is it that gets blamed when the project falls behind? It's the project manager, isn't it? Yeah. It doesn't matter whose fault it is, really. The project manager gets the blame. So make sure you're monitoring your adversary in great detail to make sure what he or she says is actually happening. If possible, get him or her replaced. Go to the project owner and say, this person is not fulfilling my needs. Please, can I have somebody else? Now, you might think, that's kind of nasty. Neil's really rotten. Well, if it really was the, the prince, Machiavelli, you know, he'd assassinate this person. I'm not suggesting that you assassinate the person, 
But if you just get the person moved to a different job, it's really a kindness, isn't it? Yeah? So try and get rid of this person because, again, it's important. You must get the project finished on time and you must look after your own health. And you're also looking after the jobs of everyone else concerned. So if this person is a saboteur, get rid of the person, if at all possible. And if you can't get rid of him or her, insulate him or her. What do I mean by this? Now, I mentioned your lieutenant or lieutenants a few minutes ago. Let your adversary appear to be continuing to do your job. But we've all got people that help us, trusted lieutenants. We sometimes call them gophers. Yeah? Get your lieutenant to follow the person around, you know, undercover, and ask all the people that are actually doing the jobs. In other words, have a, a shadow to the adversary. Not visible to the adversary, but a shadow that's talking to all the people, that's checking up. If something's not getting done, your lieutenant, your shadow, is making sure that the bite-sized pieces, the tasks, get done on time. Yeah? So in, in essence, essentially, your adversary become, becomes redundant, unimportant. So edge the person out, either visibly or invisibly, but just make sure that the jobs are getting done and your project stays on time. Broaden your support base, yeah? The person may try, as I said earlier on, may go to your boss, may go to the team, they may dirty your name, they may make up stories about you, complete nonsense. They may make you try to look completely incompetent. So what you do is you broaden your support base. In private, you're going and you're visiting with people, you're making sure they see the real you, the kind you, the professional you, the expert you, the supportive you, Make everybody like you, respect you, support you, so that when the CEO or the project owner starts hearing these rumors about you and they go and ask person A, oh, what do you think about so-and-so? Oh, he's great. He's really good at what he does. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah? So you're working behind the scenes, building up your support base all the time. So a lot of what I've said, I know, is very, very controversial. It takes a bit of getting used to the idea that there's somebody that potentially can be on your team who really has a hidden agenda. And if you'd like to discuss it with me just now or in private afterwards, you know, I'll be very happy to talk with you. Yeah? But essentially, what I've been trying to do is to get you from stressing and losing sleep to sleeping like a baby by copying Niccolo Machiavelli and metaphorically, getting rid of the psychopath. Thank you all for listening. We've got time for questions over here. I'll pack, bring the mic over. Hi. <coughs> My name is David, by the way. Um, so I, I see that you're assuming that most of the time conflict arises from a personal position or from a personal interest of somebody else, right? But oftentimes, conflict is a result of misalignment in terms of goals and priorities. So <clears throat> is it a safe approach to first assume that there is a personal agenda? Um, or should we kind of go first to make sure that the goals and priorities are aligned? and then confirm that we have a person here that it's a troubled person and then apply these rules. What would you think and say about that? I've thought about this long and hard. The, the, the question is, if I may para paraphrase, please. The studies show that somewhere between 3% and 4% of senior managers in the United States are psychopaths. And my belief is that there are a few other people who are wannabes, not necessarily psychopaths. They're just very, very driven to move up the corporate ladder quickly and or get higher salary at your expense. But it's still a minority. So guesstimate, I guesstimate that over 90% of conflict comes from normal people. From normal people. 
And it would be very easy for me to answer your question and say, let's give everybody the benefit of the doubt. And I'm saying the problem is that when you have someone who's disruptive or has an abnormal psychology or who has their own hidden agenda, if, if you give him or her the benefit of the doubt, they will see your weak point and they will start working against you. But they are so good at it, so suave, so charming, that it will be a long time before you ever even realize that you're in, uh, in trouble. So what I'm suggesting is, and, and by the way, there, it'll just seem like an incongruity. You will blame yourself. You will think, oh, I'm doing something wrong. I'm not getting through to the person. You know, it, it, it's, it's like we have a tendency to try to be liked by people. So if someone doesn't like us, we naturally try to accommodate them to make them like us. Have, have you, I'm sure you've all been in situations like this before. Yeah? It's the normal way that we behave. And to this small minority of people, we're exposing ourselves, we're exposing our weaknesses, we're actually being manipulated. And by the time that we realize that something unusual, something abnormal is happening, it's too late. So what I'm suggesting to you is this. In a project management situation, do not give the benefit of the, of the doubt. Assume it first that everyone is out to get you. Yeah? And once you realize for sure that this person is a normal person, and this person is a normal person, and this person can be trusted, and this person is working to help you, then be conciliatory towards these people in private. In private. And there may come a time in due course that you discover, oh, the problem really was with me. I said something, I said something silly that was misinterpreted. I used a word in a particular way and the word was ambiguous. And this person took umbrage and now I can apologize. And then we can go back to what we would all regard as normal human behavior in the business place. Yeah? So just to reiterate, I'm saying that my belief is there's a very small percentage of people who will behave in an abnormal or malicious manner. And I'm saying you have to protect against yourself against them first, and then for the majority of people, once you know you can trust them, then you use conciliatory tactics, you, know, you use your soft skills, and then build up their confidence in the normal way that we, as project managers, would do to build up a team. How would you manage a situation where you find the project uh, project manager or, or sorry project owner or a manager you're working for is in the three or four percent? Very very hard question to answer. the The question is, what would you do if you discovered that the project owner was one of that three or four percent? And I am going to wimp out and throw it back at you. Does anybody have a, an opinion or a suggestion? What do we do if our effective boss, in this case the project owner, is a mani manipulative person like this? Any thoughts? Please. Just try and bring in as, a, as an ally of yours, right? I guess if, if he is the sponsor, there is value in the project for him. So figure out what the value is and work towards making sure that you deliver on that. He will be an ally. He'll work for you. It's not easy enough. Okay, I think you would put yourself in a very soul-searching position because you're, you're still talking about um, restating, restating the objectives or, or the scope of the project, getting it all written down again. Older should have some interest, right? So if you're, if he's a sponsor, there should be some value for him. So that should be a priority for you to deliver. That, that, that's how I would approach it. That's how you would ap uh, approach it. Um, Neil, I, I, have, I have a similar experience. Oh, you have? Yeah, Please. so I, I, I was involved with a startup and the founder basically was a, a manipulator and 
and had a hidden agenda. And it took me a long time to figure out that it was really about, he had to be viewed as, you know, the, the brains and the doer of everything. So he had to take credit for everything. And it basically put me in a, in a situation where I, there was no choice for me but to leave. That's what, I, no, that was my only choice. Thank you. And that would be my advice as well. I would leave. I would with, withdraw from that project because you're in a lose-lose situation. There is no way. If, if a psychopath or someone similar, sociopath, um, is the one that's directing you, the one to whom you're reporting, you cannot win. You cannot win, therefore, walk away. No compromise at all. <laughs> I'm sorry, please say again. So, so no compromise. So, so there, there won't be any compromise, in other words. Well, that's the thing. We're making the assumption, we're making the assumption, the gentleman said no, so no compromise. We're making the assumption that the person can be compromised with. And this is the trap that we normal people fall into. We assume that we can compromise. Because I know I could compromise with you and I could compromise with you, Dave. I could compromise with everybody in this room. Yeah? But you cannot compromise with this person. Because if they can't empathize with me, they also cannot compromise with me. You, you, you with me? We, we are defenseless, apart from what I suggested in you know, my 10 slides. We essentially, I am defenseless against this kind of person. I just cannot cope with a psychopath. Yeah? Thank you. Ma'am? So uh, help me out because I think I'm struggling a little bit with a person who, who brings conflict to the project, uh, and this may be caused by personal reasons, or this person may be overworked, you know, maybe short of resources, uh, uh, different things, right? Versus someone who is malicious mm -hmm. um, and a psychopath, mm -hmm. right? I, I see these as two separate things. Yes. And the malicious psychopath person, that's the extreme, and we follow that approach mm -hmm. that you just walked through. But the person who brings conflict may not be a psychopath or a malicious person. So how do you deal with those uh, types of issues? Thank you for your question. So the question is that somebody who's creating conflict may not be a psychopath or similar or a wannabe, may just be having personal problems potentially at home in their, in their personal life. What I didn't mention earlier on during the introduction is um, before, I, uh, before I came to the United States 16, 17 years ago, I was actually a manufacturing manager and um, I supervised groups of people on the shop floor. I had between 32 and 120 people working for me. So on a regular basis, there would be conflict between uh, workers or between workers and supervisors and vice versa. And more often than not, when I, nine times out of ten, when I went and investigated, the root cause was something personal that was happening in the person's life, and it could be fixed in what we would all regard as the normal way. So I don't mean to diminish the tool at all, the tools that we all have in terms of looking after people, identifying people's personal needs, helping them helping them feel happy in their job, helping them um, elevate themselves in the job, uh, learn new skills, etc., things like that. I don't mean to diminish that at all. What I'm saying is that, that you have to protect yourself, yourself, against the small number of malicious people. And I would come back to the point I made earlier on that the normal person, which includes someone that's having some kind of personal issue, yeah, you can later on identify that it's not a malicious person. You can then go to that person and you can help them solve their problem. But first, you have to protect yourself from the devious psychopath that's going to try to pull the wool over your eyes and manipulate you. So I agree with what you said, ma'am. I'm just saying delay, delay a little while until you're absolutely sure that it, the person is one of that 
95% of what I regard as normal people. Quick question. So are sociopaths a subset of psychopaths? Or am I opening another can of worms? Uh, no, again, I, have, I don't have a qualification, so I'm not at liberty to, I mean, liberty of course. I, I can't give a professional opinion. However, I have read several articles, um, including one just this morning, where they, they com compared sociopaths to psychopaths, and there are a, a great deal of overlap in the way that, that, that people behave. And quite often, uh, an individual will fall into this gray area where they could be classified in, in, in either way. Sir? To, uh, to what extent do you think organizational culture contributes to, to conditions of stress and conflict in the workplace? That's a more general question. You're asking um, to what extent do organizations cause stress for people? Because that's a, that's a fairly difficult thing to manage if you're trying to work in a culture that, that and there are many that promote a lot of internal conflict. Yes. That, I think that's a whole different kettle of worms that could take us off a, a, in a tangent. What I would like to say, though, is I've noticed uh, during the, certainly the last 10 years, uh, during the financial crisis, that uh, many companies have had reductions in, in force, if you like, and many people have found themselves having to do more and more, which is adding to their stress, of course, quite separate from the potential for psychopaths. But also, it's meant that some people who have been very good at doing a functional job have been promoted into a position for which they may not be, qualified is not the right word, for which they may not have the skill set. So the promoted person who's got a small team working for them, statistically speaking, is not going to be malicious. They're going to be one of that potential 95%. They may just be clumsy. And one of the things I personally would like to see businesses doing in the Western world, particularly here in the United States, is give a little bit more support to people managers, a little bit more training to people managers. Because sometimes when somebody comes to them with a problem, they really don't know how to, to cope with it. It's very difficult for them to empathize if it's a problem that they personally have not had before. And also another little aside is I've noticed that um, human, human resources, in many instances, feel the greatest obligation to the business for which, which they support. Yeah? So they're going to tend to see a problem employee as someone who, needs to be ch someone who needs to change or perhaps be replaced, rather than looking for the root cause uh, and keeping that employee and helping that employee to, to grow into uh, the particular seat, the position that they are, they are in. I hope that answers the, the question. But again, sorry, just to reiterate to everybody, all of these normal situations, once you're certain that you're in what I regard as a normal human situation, human behaviors, please treat it in just the same way as you've always done professionally in terms of asking open questions, empathizing with people, trying to support them, you know, being good friends, being good colleagues, being good managers. All I'm saying is, be advised, be aware that some people, like this man here, I didn't give his name, it's not important, yeah? Some people, you know, do exist, and you need to protect yourself against them. Be very, very wary and on guard. Please. I have a follow-up question. So, it, it's still, the idea is, is counterintuitive in the sense that I see that you are first escalating the conflict, right? And then once you identify that this person is not a, you know, in the group of person that have, you know, bad intentions, then you de-escalate the conflict. Okay. I, I'm not comfortable with using these particular words, escalate and de-escalate. Because essentially, in an ideal situation, well, this is not an ideal situation, but the best situation is where it's neither escalated or de-escalated. You just become immovable. You just become stony-faced. You're in a position of power, yeah? And you cannot be forced to give concessions. So you're not escalating it, you're just refusing to succumb. You're refusing to be manipulated. You're keeping your guard up, yeah? 
and not letting the potential saboteur, adversary, get their foot in the door, not get the wedge in. You're, you're not revealing personal. Most of us build empathy in the workplace by revealing things about ourselves. We, we let people see the human side. We talk about our children, our family, how we feel about a bereavement. We talk about, we, 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 we talk about our child playing, playing soccer, you know, or, or going to gymnastics. You know, we, we talk, oh, I injured myself over the week, that sort of thing. What I'm saying is now you don't do that. You don't give away any personal information that could be used as leverage, you know, for that person to, to, to regard as a weakness if you like. So we're not escalating, we're just simply maintaining a stony-faced facade and refusing to take any, accept any nonsense or manipulation from the potential um, adversary. Thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm sitting here thinking a few things in between your beginning and the uh, ending where we were at uh, psychopaths, there are actually a few gates that we would go through. And uh, from the initiation of a project, there's project authority that's established. So those who are under project authority, there's one way of certainly dealing with those folks. Those who are above or peers to the project, that's a, that's a different story. And there's some other things we have to do. There's also the two aspects of stakeholder grooming interviewing and grooming, yes. making sure that we do have the right people in the right bus, on, in the right seat, on the right bus, so on. Uh, and then there's also, um, oh, accountability and responsibility when we look at the RACI chart. Uh, a lot of places where I've seen saboteurs or um, people who just don't want to see you succeed um, are, show up at meetings. And one way to control that is by looking at the RACI chart and only allow people who are responsible and accountable to participate. And consultants and informed folks don't have an opinion. They could certainly approach me and, and give me a heads up or raise an issue or identify a risk, and I will take it to that meeting. But those folks don't have an opinion in those kind of meetings. Then there's the other thing, and uh, I think it's Appendix... Um, G of PMBOK 5, um, which talks about the six or eight different attributes about working with teams. And um, those things are a good thing to keep in mind for project managers, and it covers everything from cultural differences and, and so on. They're, they're, it's really a great list. But we have to be sensitive to those things and that something that we perceive as a threat may not be a threat. It's just a different way of participating in a team. Uh, then the, the other thing I was going to mention is um, there's also the authenticity that a project manager should be working from, going back to your last point about being vulnerable. Um, sometimes it's too late. Uh, that person has already picked up on a few of your personal temperaments, capabilities, your vulnerabilities, and have attempted to exploit them. Um, at that point, you need to skip the being stone-faced and go straight to action. Mm -hmm. no, I, I, I loved every single point that you made there, um, including the fact that it may well be too late and it's going to be very difficult to do something about that. But I want to come back to your first point. The, the process works, in my opinion, that you just outlined, if everybody is behaving in the normal fashion. Now remember that this, this, this person, this potential saboteur or adversary is going to come to every meeting. He or she's going to be absolutely charming, everybody's best friend, and they're always going to give the appearance of doing everything that they're meant to be doing. So that if you were then to go to somebody else and say, this person's, you know, wasting the time. Sab oh, nonsense. Don't be ridiculous. You know, it's one of the friendliest people I've ever met in my life. It's going to be very, very difficult for you to prove it. And indeed, one thing I didn't see is that really, outside of your trusted lieutenants, I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't even try to state to other people that this person is sabotaging your project because nobody will believe you. Please, you had a, another yeah. 
when dealing with those kind of folks, uh, accountability and responsibility are two sides of the same coin. Yes, yes. And if someone wants to sabotage a project from a, pers a position of accountability, then I make them responsible. And I hold them to responsible until they fail. And then we deal with it on a disciplinary basis. Um, so if you, when you have a troublemaker, just make them responsible for the problem. It's real simple. They'll either fix it or they'll move on. I want to say I like your style. I, I know I could see when you were speaking assertively to me, your whole, ba uh, your whole body language and your facial expression was very authoritarian. You were very definite in what your expectations were. So I would say that if you were to adopt this or maintain what you're doing just now, you would possibly have um, more, be far more effective in this situation than perhaps some other people would be with different behavioral um, management styles, if you like. But yeah, authoritarianism, draconianism, you know, being very, very clear, very, very logical, none of the, the, the fluffy, touchy, feely stuff is going to work in this kind of situation. Thank you for that point. Any more questions? Going once? Well, let's, let's thank Neil for a wonderful job.